Hi, good evening everyone. So, um, it's actually been a long day. This is my, I think, sixth or seventh speech today. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully I saved the best for last, right? I actually I want to share something so beautiful with you. Does anyone here listen to Radio Hidabrut? You should listen. Uh, it's Hidabrut, Hidabrut Radio. So, um, I, I think mainly it's in Brooklyn, although it's growing, but it, thousands of people listen, and uh, I, I speak in Radio Hidabrut on Mondays at between 10 and 12. And each week, I try to speak about something that would you know, people should be interested in it, and we'll speak about the situation of shaduchim or kids at risk, or divorcees and who's taking care of them, or we'll speak about what defines Jewish music, and whatever it is, whatever's on my mind that week, and maybe it's tied into the parsha, maybe it's tied into current events, and it may not be, it doesn't make a difference, if it's on my mind and I'm passionate about it, I'll speak about it and hopefully we'll get a, a nice reception and people will uh, call on the show and they'll text and uh, it'll be an exciting show. So this morning I decided I'm going to speak about Shalom Bias. Always relevant, you know, people who are married and even people who are thinking of getting married have to consider the ramifications of learning how to keep peace in the home. And what happens is, we usually speak about what the issues are, and of course, when we speak about issues, people have a lot to say. And after about 10 minutes of the show, I changed my mind. I said, I don't like where this is going. You know, people should call up and say, oh, I, we're having a problem at home. I don't know, it's sort of a downer at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I just, I, I, I said, you know what? I think the reason that Shalom Bias is an issue in many homes, it's because we focus on the negative in the home instead of focusing on the positive. And all of those positive and virtuous traits that our spouse brings to the table, we take for granted because we're used to them. And whether those, whether that's just the fact that your husband brings home a paycheck, or you bring home the paycheck, or the dishes are washed, and the laundry is folded, and he's patient, and she's kind, and they do chesed, and you know, that's all expected. So what we do is we focus on, yes, he's all that, but this is what really gets to me, it really bothers me, or she's all that, but I, you know, I really wish... I wish you wouldn't be like this in this particular issue. And then we focus on it and focus on it until all of the other things recede into the background and all we could think about is, wow, this is really an issue for me. And eventually, if you build up the issue in your mind in a big enough way, you're going to say, you know what, I, I'm just not comfortable with this marriage, it's not what I bargained for. And you know, there's divorce out there, and sometimes divorce is necessary. I had a, I had a son who asked me just recently over Yontif, we had many divorces, and one of my sons said to me, he said, Tati, out of all the people who are divorced here, how many people do you think could have made it if they had worked a little harder? So my answer to him was, I have no idea, because I don't know their stories, and even if I knew their stories, it would be on a superficial level and not on an emotional level. But the idea that one of my children should understand that just because there is rift and dissension and argument doesn't mean to say goodbye, say the end. Sometimes it's just we have to focus and appreciate what we did gain from our spouse. So on this radio show, I said, you know what? In the non-Jewish world, they have, a, they, are, they have programs that play music and people can call up and dedicate love songs to the one they love. Oh, play such and such, because it says how much I love you. Okay, this is going out to Cindy. Cindy, this is from John. Da 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 da. Okay, he loves you, right? Just, the, just like the words of the song. So we don't have that, but I said, let's do something similar to that. I'm gonna open up the phone lines.
And I'm going to open up the, the text where people text a text and then I read it on the air. I'm going to open this up. And Klai Yisrael, tell me what you appreciate about your spouse. What do you want to thank Hashem? What do you want to say Moida'ani for when you look at the one who you love? What do you want to say thank you for? We set a record this morning. A record. Our phone lines burnt up. The text messages came in so fast and so furious. And I think, you know, in the media they say bad news is good news. Because in the bad news, everyone sells newspapers. So when you speak about something positive, no one wants to speak about positive. Let's speak about the issues. Let's speak about hurt. Let's speak about pain. Well, Kali sort of proved that wrong on this day. Because there was so much love. One lady calls up, I want to thank my husband for making Shabbos in our home full of Kedusha. She says, I know some husbands, they speak about mundane things at the table and it brings down the Shabbos table and then the, and then the wife is like, honey, maybe you have a Dvar Torah and the wife tries to get it back on track and give it some Kedusha. She says, I don't have to do that. My husband knows how to keep Kedusha on the table. And a man call up and say, and I would like to express on the air my appreciation for my wife who changes smelly diapers. <laughs> yes. Yes, they smell but they smell just as much for her as they do for me. And she does it, and she does it with a simcha, and she does it, and I want her to know I appreciate it. Two people called up, and they said, you know, we're married for one year, but we see so much that every day that we're married, we see more in our spouse, and we thank Hashem more each and every day. And, um, and it, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And there were twice during the show... I had to like com <coughs> compose myself because I was about to cry. Like when you see so much raw emotion and thanks instead of the typical let's bash, let's speak about kids at risk, let's speak about th this at risk and this is bad and this is wrong and the Haredi this and the this that. No, let's speak about what we appreciate in our spouse. And it was so wonderful. So the show finished and... <coughs> I went on to my next speech. I spoke at Machon Beis Yaakov. And as I speak at Machon Beis Yaakov, I get a text. And the text says, in the spirit of your amazing show, I want to express my Akar to you. I don't have a day that goes by without thanking Hashem for having you in my life. I want to let you know these sentiments. <coughs> Chazak v'yamatz, your loving wife, Shani. <laughs> it was from my wife. So, in the spirit of the show, there was so much love. So, I have to start off with this, because what I want to speak about tonight, we're going to speak a little bit about... <coughs> It's Sadik Viralo. When we look around the world and we see pain. And it's a deep and difficult subject. We're in Sphira, and there was a lot of pain. Many people were nifter during Sphira. Many of the Talmidim of Rabbi Akiva. And we see pain, and right away we have a problem, we have an issue. How could Hashem? Why did Hashem? And so on. So before we even begin, I was thinking to myself how appropriate this show is today, right before we speak about Tzadik Varalo, because I had a student who said to me, I don't believe in God. Okay, you know, that's, I work on a college campus and that's where you get a lot of people. Don't, I said, why don't you believe in God? So he says to me, because why do so many bad things happen to good people? I say, I don't understand what A has to do with B. He says, well, I don't believe in God because so many bad things happen to good people. I said, so why, so why don't you believe in God again? He says, because I said, because so many bad things happen to good people. I say, what does that have to do with God? Maybe God, maybe God is bad. Why are you assuming God is good and therefore, if God is good, 
then he can't exist because so many bad things happen. Maybe your assumption's wrong. Maybe God has is bad. Why, why, why is that not a good answer for you? What does bad things have to do with God existing? But it's simple. The simple reason why this person jumped to that conclusion is because we assume that if there's a God, he must be good. Now, what gives us that right to assume? To assume that. Why do we assume God is good? Says so one person once said, "Well, if there's a if God is bad, I'd rather not live in that world." That's a silly answer because it's an emotional answer which does not address the question. Whether whether you want to live in this world has nothing to do with the fact of God being bad or good. I'm just take, I'm just looking at your equation. You said, I don't believe in God because God, because so many bad things happen to good people. And I'm saying back to you, maybe God is bad. You don't assume God is bad. You know why you don't? It's very simple. Because if you take all of the bad, all of the tragedy, all of the disaster, and you put it on one side, it doesn't equal even a small fraction of the good that is happening at the very same moment. While... 200,000 people were dying in a tsunami. 7 billion people were being fed. And even during the war, even during the Holocaust, even at the darkest time and the, and the, and the, and the most desperate hour, Hashem still made sure that our hearts would beat. Hashem still made sure that people would be fed. And Hashem kept this world going with all of its beauty and with all of its splendor. And therefore, when a person looks around the world, they do see beauty. They see majesty. The only thing is, it seems to be inconsistent. There seems to be an inconsistency. And therefore, and therefore, they say, if God is good, and I'm assuming God is good because I see so much good happening, then why do some bad things happen as well? That's their question. So there are five major approaches to this question. There are five basic approaches to this question. Why do bad things happen to good people? The question is a legitimate question. And it doesn't need me to say it's legitimate. Moshe Rabbeinu himself said, Hareini no es kevodecha. Chazal explained that that means that Moshe Rabbeinu said, why do bad things, tzaddik v'ra'la rosh why do bad things happen to good people? There was a man by the name of Harold Kushner who lost a son, very tragically. He's a conservative rabbi. So after he lost his son, he decided to write a book. And he named the book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? It's sort of stunning that there was never a book written by that name until Harold Kushner. But Harold Kushner wrote it, and that that book resonated with many people and he made tons of money, became very famous as the why do bad things happen to good people. So what was his great answer? His answer was, it must be, if God could let my son die, it must be that God created the world and then let the world be. And has no ashkacha pratis, does not control anything. He made the world and then pulled away. Now, besides that intellectually, that makes very little sense. Intellectually speaking, when the, the way we understand creator is a creator invests in the creation. It makes very little sense to create and then, okay, now let's see them fight it out. Let's see them destroy themselves. It makes very little sense, right? Aside from that, the whole, the whole notion is a very self-serving notion because why do you assume that you're a good person? Right? And that's, that's what we learn. The way we learn, and the way we learn as far as Musser goes, is we say, you know what? I have done enough wrong in my life that if anything happens to me, I can pin it on a number of things that I deserve it for, whether it's Brachas Kavana or Lashon Hara. Right? There's no lack of things that Hashem could look at me and say, you know what, Klatsko, you got plenty that, that, uh, on your cheshben. Uh, Hashem should protect me from it. 
But if something happens, I don't have to, oh, I'm a good person, how could a bad thing happen? Hashem should watch us and wait until we do Teshuvah. But really, the question itself does not make any sense. There are certain questions that sound very legit, but the question makes no sense. And when you hear the question, you say, oh, that's a good question, until you think about it. I'll give you one of the famous examples is the old philosophical question to disprove Hashem. And the question is, can God create a rock that he can't lift? Ever hear that question? Can God make a rock? And either way, it proves there's no God. Why? Because if he could make it, then he can't lift it. So God is not all-powerful. And if he can't make it, then he's still not all-powerful. So either way, he's not all-powerful. Sound like a very legitimate argument, right? No, not legitimate. You know why? Because its supposition is incorrect. Because really, what's the question? Really, what's the, what's the hidden parentheses in that question? It's not, can God make a rock that he can't lift? If you look at the way the question's asked in philosophy, it's, if asked, can God make a rock, a rock that he can't lift? And you know why they put in the word, if asked? Because it takes the free will out of Hashem's hands. Because if you just ask a question, can God create a rock that he can't lift? The answer is that question makes zero sense. Because what, what character traits did he create within that rock? Did he, does he want that rock to be a rock that he could lift? Then he could lift it. Does he want it to be a rock that he can't, that, that he can't lift? Then his will is that he can't lift it. Either way, he's all powerful. It, it, asking that question is almost like saying, can Hashem say yes and no at the same time? Can he create a rock that he can't lift? Well, what was his kavana? If his kavana was that it shouldn't be lifted, then he's all powerful because his kavana was fulfilled. And if he wants it to be lifted, then he can lift it because that's his kavana. So that's why we say, if asked, so someone else wants it to be. But that's not Hashem, right? If, if once you phrase that question like that, then you're not speaking about the same Hashem that I recognize. Because Hashem is the one who makes his own decisions. Right? Hashem's not asked. Okay? So you understand? That was sort of deep and quick, but I think you got it. So too, why do bad things happen to good people is a question that is full of hidden parentheses. Okay? Should we explore what is the, what is the question? Hey, why do bad things happen to good people? I'm so smart. Well, let's figure it out. The very first parentheses in that question is the following. It's not why do bad things happen to good people. Parentheses. Why can't I understand, end of parentheses, why do bad things happen to good people? That's the real question. Because if you take away why can't I understand, so then you have your answer. Why do bad things happen to good why, why, why do bad things happen to good people? You can't understand it. So that happens. There are things you can't understand. Well, why can't I understand? You, under, you understand? So, okay, are you following? This will get a little deep. So the question of why do bad things happen to good people is really asking, why can't I understand why bad things happen to good people? But we're not finished yet. There's a brackets within the parentheses. Because who, who am I? Why can't I understand? Who am I? Who am I? I am a... I'm a person. I'm a person. So what is a person by definition? Well, by definition, a person is very limited. We're weak. We're fragile. We don't know the future. We're not all powerful. We're not all knowing. Right? That's the definition of an I. Why can't I? Meaning, why can't people? Unless I think I'm not a person. So if I'm a person, I would say, why can't I? Brackets, who is a person who is not all powerful, not all knowing, weak, don't remember what I had for breakfast, and so on. Why can't I understand why Hashem, or why God, one second. What's your definition of God? I'll we'll make sure we're speaking about the same definition. Anyone want to give me a definition of God? <coughs> all powerful. All powerful. All knowing. All knowing, right? That's the definition of God. If you don't think God is all powerful, all knowing, then you're speaking about a different God than me. Okay? So now let's look at the entire question. Why can't I, who is not all powerful, not all knowing, have, have very, very little say in what goes on in the universe? Why can't I understand why God, who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, makes bad things happen to good people? 
Well, now you have your answer. The answer is in the question. The answer is because you're, 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 you're a three-month-old that cannot understand why you pay taxes because you don't know money exists. So you want to understand why you can't understand that being is all-knowing. Well, that's because you're not all-knowing. You don't know history. You don't know the past. You don't know the future. There's very little. And that's not even addressing the bad and the good because how do you know what bad is? Why, why, why do bad things happen? You know what a bad thing is? To good people, you know what a good person is? Shmuel didn't know. HaKadosh Baruch told Shmuel that you see, what, you see with your heart. You, you, see, you see with your eyes. I see in the heart. So the question itself is lacking. Yeah? I don't think that's the question. Which? I don't think that's the question. I think the question is why didn't God give us the ability to understand what that means? Why didn't he give us the ability to understand? If he gave us the ability to understand that, then... I don't think anyone has that in mind when they ask the question. But if they do, if they do, then I can give you an answer to that as well. I don't think that's a good one. Why didn't Hashem give me the ability to see the future? What? He didn't even give Moshe the ability. Right. Why is it that we don't even have the power to understand it? Okay, so why don't we have the power to understand why bad things happen to good people? Right? That's, that's really... Why, don't, why didn't Hashem give me that power? So part of that power is going to be the power to know the future. Because most, if not all, of ramifications or outcomes of what a person does is not known instantly. So it's played out over time. So if you want to know why didn't Hashem give us the ability to see into the future, or oh, we should all be Naveem, I can give you... He showed Moshe the future, he still didn't. Even Moshe, even Mo, no, he didn't show Moshe the exact future. He gave him one example. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know the future. If Moshe Rabbeinu had known the future, then he wouldn't have hit the rock. Moshe Rabbeinu did not know the future. Hashem, once in a while, would give a Navi a glimpse into the future. But the, the, the lack of free will that would incur from knowing the future would, uh, would negate our reason for existence. If I know what's going to happen, let's say a person cheats. If they know the future, they're going to get caught thrown to jail. Would they ever cheat? I wouldn't. But you think you'll get away with it. Some of them know, and they still do. That's true. Some people are like that. <laughs> the, the criminal returns to the scene of the crime, right? He knows the police are there, but he can't help himself. But in general, Hashem is not going to give us that ability. Okay? So, you had a question? Okay. So that's on a simple level. But so, so therefore, before we even go into answering the the some of the, or, or uh, using some of the approaches to understand why do bad things happen. The first thing we need to do is then we need to come with a tremendous humbleness and understand that we know less about the cheshbonos, the calculations of Hashem, than a three month old knows about paying taxes. We know less about what Hashem does. Now, my three month old does not know that money exists. He barely knows that I exist. And he certainly doesn't know a government exists. And he doesn't know that streets have to be upkept. And he doesn't know that firemen have to be paid. So he doesn't understand taxes. And yet he still understands them on his level better than we understand how Hashem runs this marvelous universe. And therefore we come with the humbleness. Now, sometimes Hashem will allow us to glimpse into the future or to look back and see how his master plan is laid out. Sometimes he does it and we don't even put, we don't even connect the dots. And when that happens, it's our own fault. I want to tell you a story. Six years ago, we moved from Los Angeles, California. Five years ago, our house burned down. Oops. My house burned down. My wife calls me up. I was in Texas, I was training in some rabbis over there for a new coil, and I get a phone call, my wife gets on the phone, and she says, I have a question, does Hashem love us? Now my wife is a 
base sack of Borough Park girl, and that, just, that question just seems very out of character. Of course Hashem loves us. Why are you asking? She said, one second, one more question. Is everything Hashem does for the best? <laughs> I said, Ashani, now you're really scaring me. What's going on? She says, okay, first, first of all, everyone's okay. She's, she says that to calm me down. She doesn't realize that scares me much more because you know, like, if we're, we're talking about life and limb, that means like, till there. So she says, first of all, everyone's okay. But I just want to let you know that I'm sitting outside on the front lawn. We have six fire trucks here and our house is burning down. Now we own that house. We, we, we had that house um, one year and we bought it at the top of the market. Like the very next month, the prices, the bubble burst, the prices went all the way down. So bought at the top of the market. Now that house is gone. And that was it. So I told, I told the rabbis in the middle of training, okay, got to go. They said, where are you going? Back to New York. Why? Well, my house just burned down. <laughs> no, really, rabbi, why? No, really, my house is burned down. <laughs> so I put it down. And I had this long flight to JetBlue. And I'm thinking to myself, oh no, here I have to go and rebuild the house. We have to hire a contractor and contact insurance and get an adjuster and just one thing after the next. And we have to find a new house. And it, it just, it's, it seems like an insurmountable amount of work. And remember, I brought Hashem 11 kids. I think we had 10 at the time. Enough to make it a major challenge. And... To tell you how big the challenge was, all this happened a week before Pesach. A week before Pesach. And so, yes, yeah, so everyone came over to me and shul, hey, I, I guess you did beer chametz. I guess, as if, and I had to laugh each time, as if that was the first time I heard that funny joke, which wasn't funny anyways because it was my house. Well, at least you did beer chametz. As a matter, of, what they don't even realize is when I was young, when I was 15 years old, my house burned down also on the exact same day, a week before Pesach. <gasps> exact same day, my house burned down. I don't know what that means. Sometimes things happen. We don't know <laughs> why Hashem does it, and we just say, you know what, Hashem, you run the world. I don't know why you did it. Uh, you know, we don't always have to have. You know, everything wrapped up in a nice bow. Say, ah, oh, the reason why? We don't know. I'll tell you, just to, to divert a little bit. After I got married, two weeks after I got married, I was on my honeymoon in Cleveland in my parents' basement. <laughs> Very romantic. And as I was honeymooning, uh, I got a phone call. I picked up the phone and I heard some terrible news. I heard that one of my dear friends, whose name was Yaakov Yitzchak Goldstein, was in a car accident and he was nifter. And he was, a, he was a dear friend. I was very sad. I actually had another friend I was very close with who was thrown from the car who had his arm ripped off. And then a third friend who had a seat belt on and Baruch Hashem, he, he, um, he came away with, uh, without a scratch. But... Um, one friend, the friend who lost his arm, they had to surgically reattach it. And Yaakov Yitzchak Goldstein was left there. So my wife saw my face, and she was so, uh, she saw how distraught I was. So she said, you know what, I think you should fly in for the Leviah. So I said, okay, I'm going to. So I took, I took the flight very early in the morning. I got to New York. I used my in-law's car. And I drove to the Leviah. Mm. Now, usually at a Leviah, you don't expect anyone to even notice that you're there. Such a tragedy. But the father, Rabbi Goldstein, came over to me and gave me a hug and a kiss. He said, you know, I know you just got married. And it, it was so meaningful that you came in mm. for the Leviah. That it meant so much to me. And, and I said, you know, I, ugh, we should see each other with Simchas. He was such a good boy. And I felt so bad, Yaakov Yitzchak Goldstein. And... So at the end of the, at the, end of the Leviah, I decided to drive down to the hospital where my other friend, who had his arm reattached, decided to go and visit him. And I'm driving down the BQE, and there's a place in the BQE 
Brooklyn Queens Expressway, where the where the street narrows and you go from 50 miles an hour to five miles an hour. There's almost always traffic there. So I'm driving towards the hospital and I get on the BQE and all of a sudden traffic slows down from 50 to five. So I slow down. I look in the rear view mirror and behind me is a truck. And clearly the guy is spacing out because he doesn't notice that the traffic had suddenly slowed down to five miles an hour. I had a moment to scream, which I did, and the truck plowed into my car. And it hit it at 50 miles an hour, a truck, and this car accordioned. Boom, like an accordion. And it was a nace. I was sitting there in the driver's seat. The car accordioned so badly that I ended up facing the roof of the car. The seat itself buckled under me. But without a scratch. It was a nace nigla. I come out of the car and I'm shaking and the truck driver gets out of his car. He didn't know how many people were in the car. Uh, he thought, wow, he, he for sure must have killed somebody because the car was crushed. And he looks at me and he says, I'm so sorry. I didn't know what happened. I said, it's okay. I was the only one in the car. I'm okay. I was still shaking. I said, let me have your license and registration. He said, sure, sure, sure. He takes out his license, he gives it to me, and I begin to shake. Because his name was Yaakov Yitzchak Goldstein. That was his name. He was from Israel. This person is on the license of Jacob Isaac Goldstein, an Israeli t truck driver, Yaakov Yitzchak Goldstein. The same name as the person who was Nifter. What does it mean? I don't know. I don't know what it means. I don't know. I just told you this because not everything wraps up in a neat bow. But we know Akarish Park was moving the pieces around. Because we're in his own way. So that was it. So we lost our house. Now, the difficulty was we had no place to go for Pesach. So I call the traveler's insurance and I tell the insurance, you know, we need to go to a place like a Pesach hotel that can accommodate our family, that has kosher food, that has a minion, and, and traveler's insurance. They said, okay, how much will it cost? So we priced it out, and it was about, for a family our size, about $20,000. So I called the insurance, and I say, it's going to be $20,000. And they laughed into the phone. <laughs> we're not paying $20,000 for eight days in a, in, a, in a hotel we'll put you in a holiday inn or a motel six or whatever it is and you know for 60, 80 bucks a night and that's it we're not paying 20000 I said no that's not going to do I need a place for, for Pesach so they wouldn't budge so we, we, we called out the big guns we called Aguda and the head of Aguda was a man by the name of Chaim David, please, okay? There's by, uh, by the name of Chaim David Zwebel. And Chaim David Zwebel is the head of the Aguda, and he calls up Traveler's Insurance, and he says, I'm the head of this organization that has hundreds of thousands of members. One of our members just had a devastating fire. They, we have Passover and they need a place to stay and we understand that you are their insurance carrier we just want to let you know that we expect you to accommodate this family and if you don't accommodate them we will have to let our constituents know that um, that uh, Travelers does not uh, does not take care of its religious members a mere few minutes later we receive a phone call Traveler's Insurance had a change of heart. <laughs> they didn't say why, but we knew. And they said, okay, you can go. Well, at that point, we actually have to find a hotel that would take us right before Pesach. And even though we had the money, the room, that's an issue, there's no room. So finally, we found a place um, sponsored by the Heritage Center of Portnoy, and he, and he had a place in his hotel. So he said, Rabbi Klatsky, I'll let you come if you agree to speak, let's say, four times over Yontif. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll be, I'll be happy to speak. I'm a rabbi, I like to talk. No problem, no problem. So we had a wonderful Yontif. The food was great. The food was fantastic. <laughs> it was amazing. 
uh, it, was a very, it was a very nice Yantif. And I spoke over Yantif. At the end of Yantif, I get a phone call. And the man on the phone says, Hi, my name is Rabbi Chaim Samson. And I work for Project Inspire. I think he's the founder of Project Inspire. And he said, I, I was in the hotel over Yom Tov. And I heard you speak. And I want to know if you could speak for Project Inspire. I said, sure. He said, okay, how about this coming Motzei Shabbos to speak for the Kihila and Muncie. I said, great. Meanwhile, that week, middle of davening, I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great if there was a website that could connect every Jew in the whole world with Shabbos, maybe with Shaduchim? Wouldn't that be amazing? And I thought, we'll call it See You on Shabbos. Later on, it became called Shabbat.com. I thought, wouldn't it be great to have such a thing? Of course, I couldn't afford to pay for such a huge project. So I didn't know what I'm going to do. I had no idea. But while I was there speaking for Project Inspired, that Motzei Shabbos, I said, you know what, Chevra? I want to give you a vision. Imagine if every Jew who has availability for Shabbos were to open up their home. Every person needs a place. Your son Almana's singles were to sign up to be a guest. Wouldn't it be amazing? You'd be able to take care of Bali Truvi, you'd be able to take care of, 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 of all of Kal Yisrael. After, at the end of the speech, a man comes running over to me, his name was Lavi Needleman, and Lavi says to me, Rabbi, I want to help you start off, I'll be your fundraiser. <laughs> You'll be my fundraiser? Yes, I'll raise the money. Wow, how amazing is that? So we started. And we began to build this infrastructure. Here we are a few years later, and each week, 6,000 people get invited for Shabbos. Think about it. Fire in the house, 6,000 people a week are ending up with a place for Shabbos. Disaster fire in the house. Is that a disaster? HaKadosh Baruch Hu moves the chest pieces. The chest pieces, he moves them here and there, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, trust me, my dear children, I know what I'm doing. I've run this world for longer than you even realize. Trust me. Another story. A fellow calls me up and he says, Oh, I just want to let you know, I found a place on Shabbat.com. He was an, a from guy, an older single. And he says, I want to tell you what happened to me this Shabbos. This Shabbos, I ended up by a family in Highland Park, New Jersey. And it, we were, I was enjoying Shabbos Friday night, eating by this host from Shabbat.com. And in the middle of the meal, this host is Rav. I'm speaking about his keila. He said, our keila is wonderful, but there is something that's going on that's very depressing. And I said to the Rav, what's the matter? And he said, well, there's this lady in our community. She's been in Aguna for 15 years. The husband won't give her a get, the best years of her life. And it's, it's so sad. It's so depressing. So this fellow, in the middle of the conversation, in the middle of listening to the Rav, he says, tell me, what's this lady's name? And the Rav says, okay, this is her name, this Aguna, it's Nebuch. So the Rav says, so this guest says, you know what? I know this lady. I was actually at her wedding 18 years ago. Not only was I at her wedding, I even remember something curious, something that bothered me about that wedding. So the Rav said, what was it? So the fellow says, well, you know, I was at the wedding and they called up the Adim for the Kedushin and I, I knew one of the Adim and I knew, I knew him personally and I knew he wasn't Shomer Shabbos and I was surprised that they used him to be an aide because he's got to be Shomer Shabbos to be a kosher aide. The rub begins to shake. After Shabbos, they track down the aide, they track down the witness. It turns out that the witness does admit that at that time he was not Shomer Shabbos. Today he is, but at that time he was not Shomer Shabbos. They then sent the letter to Rebbe Yashiv and Rebbe Vad Yosef. They got back a psaq, they got back an answer that she's not Naguna, because legally, according to Torah, she wasn't married, and thus she's not Naguna, she is free to remarry. Now think about it. Think about it. Fire in my house and Aguna can remarry. Who are we? What do we really know? We know, ay, 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 fire. What do we know? 
Maybe HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted that particular guest to find, to find this rub so that the Aguna can be freed. And the shliach was a website that only had the, the that, that was only built because I had a, a donor, a guy who would raise funds, and I only found him because I spoke at a hotel, and I was only the hotel because I wasn't at home because my house burnt down. <laughs> it's simple. It's ABC. No. You go to Lancaster. Do I go to Lancaster? That Chavez with our report. I mean that pizza. I don't remember that where it was. Why? Well, yeah. Like you were there? Yeah. I, it was a beautiful, I have to tell you, I ate so much. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Matzah. Where are you? And meat. This, this year you were Project Inspired, right? This, I spoke at Project Inspired. This year I was at home. We had 70 guests. It was beautiful. One more story. One more. Because we got to connect the dots here. In the year 2010, on December 26th, there was an epic snowstorm. And I do mean epic. Which was, what seemed to be very unfortunate because I was supposed to fly to Israel that night. And it was, it was really something for the ages. I remember going out, I had to give something to one of my sons, Rabbeim, and the snow was coming down so quickly that I could barely make it from my house, in, from, from my car, which for some reason I drove a few blocks all the way till the Rebbe's house. It was ridiculous. No one in their right mind was going out at night, except for me, because afterwards I had decided to go to JFK, because maybe the plane's going to leave. <laughs> know what I was thinking. So usually from month to the JFK is an hour, hour and a quarter. It took me from six in the afternoon, in the evening. The flight was for, I don't know, 12, 12.30. I figured, okay, six hours enough to get to the airport. Wrong. <laughs> I left at six, and we got to JFK at three in the morning. Wow. Nine hours, nine hours we drove. And even that, Baruch Hashem, I had this amazing driver. I wasn't driving myself. And he just, he just kept knowing how to get out of these situations. Everyone was littered to the side of the road. I get there at three in the morning to find about 220 students who are part of our organization who are supposed to go on trips to Israel to learn about their Judaism and 220 students are there at JFK airport trapped. And when I say trapped, I mean trapped because half of those students were already on the plane. El Al had kept them on the plane for also almost nine hours saying, we're, we're going to go, this Israeli mentality, we're going to go odmat, 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 but in order not to waste fuel, the, the engine was off, which means that the air, there was no air. So they were sitting in a sweltering plane for nine hours. Finally, El Al gave up, and these people, all sweaty and sticky and feeling disgusting, went back into the terminal, 220 students. You can imagine the mood was bleak. It was so bad that there were people who said, I don't want to go, I don't want to, I'm going home. I'm going to call my parents, I'm going to go home. And these are people who are going to experience Torah for the first time in their lives. And now they're not going to. And food, forget about it. When people realized how big the snowstorm was, everyone ran to the store and they bought all the food. So there was no food. There was nothing to drink in the airport. No trucks were able to come in and out. And everyone was mamish trapped. So what do you do? So what did I do? I went to Shabbat.com. And I did a proximity search. It's one of the features on the site. I said, find me every host within 10 miles of the airport. Remember this? Find me every host. And select all. Message all. Boom, I select them, I messed with them all, I said, Hi, I'm Rabbi Klatsko, founder of Shabbat.com. We have 220 students, they're getting depressed, they're sad, they have no food, they have no drink, they feel sticky and disgusting and hot, and we need to help them out. What can you do? A few minutes later, we get a phone call. Hi, I was one of the people who received your message. I'm on my way with an SUV full of food. Ten minutes later... I'm not on my way. I got into a crash. A little crash. Not bad, but 
he's not coming to the airport. I think, wow, no one's going to come. Wrong. A few minutes later, my phone began to ring in such a in such rapid fashion, never in my life. One person after the next. Rabbi, what do they need? What do they need? Let me bring. I'm bringing this. I'm bringing that. One person brought 50 pizza pies. 50. Five zero. <laughs> the next person brought tons of Carlos and Gabby's. Tons of the most delicious food. One other person brought, another person brought cases of orange juice, bagels, cream cheese, lox, you name it. So much food. There ended up being an army of people who brought so much food that there was enough food not just for these students for this meal, there was enough food for all the students, for all the meals, and everyone else on the plane. Over 800 meals were brought by this army. Not only that, but half of our students, about 100 or so students, were offered and accepted to go into the SUVs to drive to Far Rockaway, which is right near JFK Airport, these people brought the college students to their house, allow them to shower, to, to rest, because the plane's not leaving for a while. Some of them were then brought over to Shar Yashiv, where they were able to hear some Torah and a shir. Other people were able to relax, and some played, played pool at some wonderful house, and they, they just chilled, and they felt good about it. And these people, who had no connection to Frumkai, some of them had never met a Frum person outside of their rabbi on campus, suddenly saw a community give them a great big hug. And they didn't know what to do with themselves. And there were some students who said the best part of their trip to Israel was when the Far Rockaway community welcomed them. Yeah. Not e even before they, 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 they flew off to Israel. And then they were brought back to the airport with plenty of time to go. And we all flew off. Eventually, 48 hours later, we flew off with Kiddush Hashem. And that was the power of our house burning down. Oh. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? It's, it's, it's so obvious, isn't it? House burns down. 220, 220 students are, 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 are Mukurov. Kiddush Hashem is made. It was on, in a, many newspapers. If you Google it, you'll see the story. Only one, I think only one newspaper gave the credit Shabbat.com. Others say, oh, I sent an email. How do I have the email of every, of every host in Far Rockaway? It's, it's on the site, obviously. I don't have everyone's email. Anyways, when we say tzaddik varalo, hakadosh baruch Hu, why do you make bad things happen? We have to stop and tell ourselves, even when things are very schwer, even when things seem bleak and we're in gullus, and we've had some very sad things happen recently. You all know what happened in France. Such such tragedy, unthinkable monsters. You know about this fire. Well, all the kids in the house were, were, were killed. And so I think the mother was? The father. was. Oh, the father was a father. A father and what was the five kids? A father and five kids. How does that mother even go on with life? I don't get it. And so on. And, and we see tragedy. And tragedy itself, we have to learn how to deal with it. Do we absorb it? Well, you can't absorb all tragedy. It'll destroy you. Right? In the olden days, there was a tragedy in Pinsk. They didn't know about it in Minsk. Happened in Novartic, they didn't know about it in Slobodka. Every tragedy was very local. Today, thanks to newspapers and the internet, that when the Ated or the Hamodiyah, the Jewish press, come into your front door, you have, the, you have the culmination of all the tragedies that are happening to the Jewish people this week. And it's depressing. So if you absorb it, you'll be ice match. If you absorb it, it'll destroy you. If you... Let it bounce off of you. Oh, that's so sad. Okay, but now let's continue our lives. So then you become callous, cold, and cruel. So we're in a very tough place. So the only place where we could go is to say, Avinu Avarachaman. What you do and why you do it is beyond us. That's this week's parsha. Vayidam Aaron. Aaron kept silent. Nadav and Avi were nifter. These wonderful, wonderful Talmidei Chachamim. These leaders of the Jewish people. Hashem, why? In the middle of Hanukkah Zabayis. Vayidam Aaron. You keep quiet. You don't know. And even when you think you know, and even when I think I know, oh, the house burned down because of this, 
I don't know one millionth of a millionth of a millionth of the reason that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made that happen. And when I eventually, in Olam Abba, La'asid Lavai, when I find out, I'm going to say, Hashem, you're so good to me. Ma'ashiv Hashem, Kol Tag Malai Alai, everything, Kol Tag Malai. Hashem, all I could do is Kos Yeshua Esa, Uvashem Hashem Ekra. All I could say is, Hashem, you know what you're doing, and I don't know what I had for breakfast. You know, you know. It's a beautiful story, it's a tragic story. There's a family named Avshaloma, and they lived in Eretz Yisrael, and it was a mother, a father, a son, and two daughters. And one day, tragically, the father was Nifter. Shalom Avshaloma was Nifter. And this mother was very Ms. Avshaloma was, was, was heartbroken. She was so sad. It's such a tragedy. At the funeral, while her husband was being buried, her oldest son, Devere, goes over to her and gives her a big hug and says, Ima, I'm going to, I'm going to look over you. I'm going to guard you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be the man of the house. And he gives his Ima a great big hug. And she knows she's got to, she's got to go on for the sake of her son and her two daughters. She has to be strong for them. A little while later, Devere was called up to duty. He was called up to serve in the Tzahal. And he was called up for an operation called Operation Cast Lead. And, you know, she said a tearful goodbye to Devere. And he was thrown into battle. And in Operation Cast Lead in Israel, they were looking for tunnels that were made to smuggle in arms to the Palestinians. And they uncovered one of these tunnels and then they had to send the soldiers in in order to clear out the tunnel and then eventually destroy it. So Devere was one of the first to go in and he never stood a chance. There was a sniper there and the sniper shot Devere and killed him on the spot. A medic came running to try to save Devere. Devere, not realizing Devere was mortally wounded, and, and the medic was shot. Although the medic survived, he was very seriously injured, but Devere was nifta. And when Miss Avshaloma heard that she lost the second man in her life, she fell to pieces. She couldn't get out of bed. She was so sad, she was so heartbroken, and it took the last of her energies to say, I have to be there for my daughters Hannah and Esther. I have to be there for them. But it was pain. And one particular morning she woke up, and she woke up crying, missing her husband, missing her Devere. And she says, Hashem, I need another hug from my Devere. I need that hug. I need to know that he's here. And she, she cried. All of a sudden there's a knock on her door. It's Hannah. Hannah says, Mom, Tonight there's an art show. They're demonstrating how to do different kinds of art. Little Chana was a budding artist. And Chana said, Ma, can you take me to the art show? At the beginning, Ms. Avshaloma thought to herself, I can't go. I can't go out. I can't go. I can't, I can't muster the courage and the energy. <laughs> but then she thought to herself, you know what? Why should Chana suffer? Because I can't pull it together. So she says, that's it, Khan, I'm going to take you. And, he t and she takes Khan that evening to a large auditorium. There were many people there. And the art demonstration began. Khan was all into it with Ms. Avshaloma. She was spacing out. She was thinking. She was full of sadness. And all of a sudden, she feels a bang on her head. Didn't hurt, but just felt like a banging. She turns around, and there's a little baby with a toy hammer hammering on Ms. Avshaloma's head. The parents, when they realized what was going on, they were mortified. And they said, they said, oh, Devere, come back, come back, Devere. So, so Ms. Avshaloma said, that's okay, don't worry, don't worry. But then Ms. Avshaloma said, I'm just curious. 
You know, how did he get that name? It's a very rare name, Devir, even in Israel. How did he get the name Devir? They say, this young couple, they said, it's an interesting story. We've never told it to anyone, but I guess since you're asking, I, I, I will tell you. You know, one morning, we, we woke up and we were reading the newspaper and we read about this terrible tragedy. There was a lady, her name is Miss Avshaloma, and she had lost her husband and then she just lost her son. He was the first soldier that was kid and killed in Operation Cast Lead. And we were so moved and so sad and heartbroken by that story that my wife, who was pregnant at that time, and I, we discussed it and we promised that if the next baby would be a boy, if our first baby would be a boy, we would name him after this brave soldier, Devere. But we never had the guts to tell Miss Avshalom. You know, we didn't know how she would take it, if she'd, be, if she'd think we were being disrespectful. One day, one day we're going to tell her. We just, we don't know how she's going to react. So Miss Avshaloma, she's so emotional. She says, I want to tell you my name is Miss Avshaloma. And that Devere was my son. He was my son. You named your son after my son. So the lady breaks into a very warm and compassionate smile. She says, wow, Ribbona Shalom. It's, it's like your son came down and gave you a hug. That was it. Miss Avshaloma began to bawl. She began to cry. And she said, I'm sorry, what did I say? She said, you don't understand. Just this morning, I dove into Hashem and I said, I need a hug from my son. I need a hug from my Devere. And here, you're saying, it's like, it's like Devere gave me a hug. It's like I got a hug from my son Devere. He said, that's the most amazing thing. To know that Devere is giving me a hug. So I tell, I tell this story. I tell this story. Because the story doesn't have a particularly happy ending. Devere did not come back to life. Ms. Avshaloma still has to proceed and continue and be strong for her daughters. But it's a little bit of a glimpse. The door is cracked open just a little bit to let Ms. Avshaloma know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu still loves her and HaKadosh Baruch Hu cares about her and there is a Nitzchias, there is a next world and Ms. Avshaloma, you're getting a hug from your son Devere and he, he's, he's, he, he still cares about you and he loves you and he's looking down from on high and he's sending that love why do bad things happen to good people? someone said to me, Rabbi why did six million people have to die in the Holocaust? I said, I'll tell you why. For six million different reasons. That's why. Do you want me to give you a blanket reason? I know why everyone died. I'm not arrogant. I'm not Hashem. I don't know why six million people died. But I do know that every person who passed away, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a cheshben. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows what he's doing. And whether a house has to burn down or whether there's an even greater tragedy and life does not come back. But the ripple effects and who that person may have inspired and what they may have done in their life and afterwards, HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs this magnificent world. And we ourselves, we just have to say, Vayidam Aaron. There are other answers to this question. Who knows what's bad? Who knows what's good? Maybe there are Gilgulim. And maybe the person came back because they're a Gilgul. Maybe HaKadosh Baruch has a greater plan for the world in general. That's the Eov answer. There are many answers. But the answer begins with Vayidom Aaron. The answer begins with a, a level of humbleness. So a Harold Kushner can jump up and say, Hey God! How could you let bad things happen to a good, good fellow like me? But we, with a humbleness, we say, you know what? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you love me more than I love me. Isn't that true? You think you love yourself more than Hashem loves you? Hashem loves you much more than you love yourself. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants what's best for us. In this world, and the next world, for our midos, for our mishpacha, Vayidam Aaron. Vayidam Aaron. So I tell you that story. Actually, we'll end, we'll end with one last story just because we have to end on a little bit of a high. I'm not sure if I told this story before, 
But if I did, it's still fun to hear. There was, um, I, I was in Atlanta. And I was flying home. And I, I arrived at the airport early. When you arrive early, you know, you try to take an earlier flight. They used to not charge for that. Recently, they charged like $50 to go on an earlier flight. But they didn't, they didn't charge. So I get to the airport, and I'm three hours early. So I go to the front desk, and I say, you know what? Can you get me on an earlier flight? So the lady behind the front desk said, well, the only earlier flight is leaving in 15 minutes, and you're never going to make it. So I said to the lady, let me try. Let me at least try. The lady says, you're not going to make it, and we can't issue a ticket. It's going to mess up the system. If you're not going to make it, it's invalid. So I said to her, one moment. I didn't show you what I have yet. And I had this beautiful box of kosher cookies. <laughs> I take it out, and I hand it to her. I said, you see these? These could all be yours for the price of a ticket change. So she shows it to her friends, and there was a consensus that they would make me a ticket. So they made me a ticket, they split up the cookies, and I was off to the races. Little did I realize that here I am in the largest airport in the United States. The Atlanta airport is humongous. So, okay, here we go. I got 15 minutes, I'm running, running, running. And as I run, I run all the way till the x-ray machine. Of course, the x-ray machine could take a long time, especially after 9-11. Time to take off your belt, take off your shoes, take off this, take off that, take off that, take off that. And you're taking everything off. And, oh, you forgot this, go back, go in. So by the time, by the time it was all done, it took a long time. I was looking at the time. Okay, well, I guess my plea is leaving right now. But who knows? Let me try to make it anyways. So... At the time of liftoff, I had just gotten through the x-ray machine, and now it's time to go to the right terminal, because I wasn't in the right terminal. Everything is connected via trains, underground trains. So I get on the escalator, and it is one of the largest escalators that you'll ever see. It's so large, it has its own escalator music. You know, you're going down, you're going down, it takes three minutes, huge now we're underneath the ground, and I say, okay, great. As soon as I get down there, the train comes. I say, okay, great. At least I'm going to hopefully catch a train. So I'm in terminal C, and I have to get to F. So I say, okay, great. C, D, F. I get on the train. Baruch Hashem, it gets there just on time. I go, and I get on the train going the opposite direction. <laughs> and oh, no, so close, not even. So now I have to go C, B, A, uh, baggage claim, ground transportation, terminal. Okay, now, wait, so everyone's on by each one. Back, bed, terminal, ground transportation, baggage claim, A, B, C, D, F. By the time I got to F, you're, you know, I missed it by like 25 minutes. Okay, one second, I got to go up the, the escalator, same escalator. So I'm taking my time, you know, it's taking forever, ever, ever, ever. I get to the top. And then I begin to run because the gate's 20 gates away and maybe I can still, you know how we do things that make no sense? Like, why are you running? Where are you running to? Your, train, your, your, your plane's not leaving for another two hours. No, got to run, who knows? So I'm running, running, running. I get to the correct gate and sure enough, the door's still open. The plane was delayed, the door's still open. I'm so happy. But the the plane was basically full, and there were just a few people who were there waiting on standby. Except that since I had a ticket, I go before them. So a few people already gotten on on standby, but I was able to be right away just to go on. So there was this young fellow, he's an you know, 18-year-old fellow, not Jewish, and um, he looks at me, and... Uh, and he's like, like, you can see the sad eyes. Like, one more guy on the plane means one less spot for him. So I look at him, and you have to remember, we're in the south. Atlanta's the south. It's very religious. So I look at him, and I shake my finger, and I say, if the Lord wants you to get on, you're going to get on. The Lord, so he nods. He's a religious, religious fellow. The Lord wants, okay, whatever. So I'm waiting there in the terminal. I, I'm not in the terminal, in, the, in the, this little tunnel. And all of a sudden, the guy in front of me says, you know what, I forgot 
my carry-on in, in, uh, in the terminal. I got to go back out of, the, out of the tunnel. So the lady, the stewardess says, you can't go back out. We don't let. He says, I have to. She says, if you go back out, I can't let you back in. I got to go out. So she says, okay, suit yourself. He runs out. She points to this guy. He says, you, come on in. Yes. So as he walks in, I shake my hand. I say, the Lord wants you to get on. You're going to get on. So he's a few He's a few guys behind me. Meanwhile, it's still not guaranteed that we're going to get on. Because what they do is they keep you in the tunnel. And then as there's a seat of ill, okay, now you can go there. You can go there. So a lady comes out into the tunnel and says, listen, we don't know if we're going to be able to get you all in. But in case we do, in case we do, I just want you to know that there's no more room in the overhead compartment. So give us your carry-on. We're going to gate check and we'll give it back to you. So all these non-Jews very daintily take out you know their headphones and that's all they need but you know I packed all yeshivish and I got everything all piled up in one mess and they got the tefillin and, the, and, the, and my talus and my gemara and this and that and, right? and I, everything is in one big rolly so I said okay I, I sit down on the floor I undo it and I begin to try to take and find underneath what I'm looking for and a few people behind me were getting all antsy I say you know what go, go ahead of me just go ahead of me so by the time I get what I need, it, the, the only people at the end of the line were me and this other guy. So he looks at me, he says, why did you let them go ahead? You may not get on this plane. I said, you're forgetting. If the Lord wants you to get on, you're going to get on. So he nods, you know. Well, one person after the next, get on, until all, the only people left in the tunnel were me and him. And then a stewardess comes out and she says... You're the only two left. I said, yeah. She said, well, we regret to tell you that there is no more room in coach, so you'll have to go first class. <laughs> I look at the guy. <laughs> so we sat next to each other in the first class in the lap of luxury. The Lord wants you to get on. You, we, we, you know, we're, we're not the chess master here. We don't know. We don't know. So when things happen, whether the outcome is wrapped up in a beautiful bow or whether it's something that's a mystery within an enigma, all we know is when a person says, why do bad things happen to good people? All I would say is, Hashem runs this world. And whatever happens with Vayidam Aaron, it's not that he resigned himself. I don't know, so I'd rather not know. Vayidam Aaron is the right answer because we say, Hashem, you love me more than I love myself. And if Hashem wants something to happen, it's going to happen and it's going to be for our good. Thank you very much.